Hello. Today is quite an exciting and unusual day for me because I have just picked half my height in books to go to the charity shop. If you'd asked in my lifetime people who knew me well what's the least likely thing Heather's ever going to do, it would probably have been give away her books, get rid of them. It's almost unheard of for me to do to get rid of so many books all at the one time instantly painlessly and I'm still in shock almost and I wanted to talk to you about it to booktube to say those of us who love books what is actually helpful for getting to the point of moving books on so I've got a very large cup of coffee to get me through all the chat the talk and uh I suggest you get one too. So as I've looked at the books, I've asked myself, why was this so simple and easy for me? Where in the past it would have been so difficult. And I think there's three reasons. Number one is very, very, very strong motivation. I want the space for something else. I'm going into a period of study and I absolutely have to get my study books and resources and notes put on shelves. So that's been huge motivation. So the other one is that Booktube itself has made me engage with my books. I now look at them because I've been reading, following Booktube for a couple of years. I was saying reading is not an interesting thing, reading Booktube. Following it for a couple of years, started my own channel about six months ago, seven months ago. And so I look at the books that are there and I say, is this book so brilliant that I can totally recommend it to somebody else? Or is it just, hmm, okay. So I've had to look at the books and say, is it worth having? Is it really brilliant? And thirdly, um, just we, we've been looking at a, a relative's house, an older relative, and we're going to have to be going through a house clear this year, probably with them to help. And I was looking at a library that just had never been changed for decades. And at the end of the day, it is going to have to be gone through. So, let's have a snapshot of what my library was like before I did this clear out. There was very little deadwood, I thought. I don't have a long list of TBR. The book is on my shelf. I've read it. I've got about 10 books that are still to be read. And so the books that are there are there because I'm interested. Most of them I can put my hand on and say, this is the book, here's what it is, I've read it, it's good, it's earned its place. So I was deeply shocked to clear so many out. It's the length of a whole bookshelf, cleared. I'm very sceptical about the new year, new you thing, but I think the slogan, new year, new space, is a really intriguing one. I've been thinking about that today, just came to me, made it up, so to speak, and it motivates me. New year, new space. And some new years feel very much like the old year, but this year, due to a variety of circumstances to do with study coming to a period coming to an end, to do with possible employment in a different area, there's lots of change possibly coming up, and so it seems to be inevitable this year is the year to reevaluate, look, and possibly have a house move. Right. Categories that the books, what helped me, what categories helped me sort through the books. I'm going to take you through the books and I want to emphasise that most of them are actually very, very good. So it's not a reflection on the book, it's a reflection on is it of use to me now and what size of space is it keeping on my shelf. If you look at the books on your shelves and you say what size are they? And then think that is blocking the space for that same width of new book or books. I have three huge thick books on the list of those I'm getting rid of. And those are going to save up a whole lot of space in themselves. Right, let's have a look at the books. Two Chunksters. Brewer's Dictionary. Phrase and Fable. Worth having, and I would keep it, but look at the spine. Another time when I have more 
space. It will be readily available in second-hand bookshops. I got that from a second-hand bookshop. Next one, again, look at the, the width. It's Which Lie Did I Tell by William Goldman. He is a well-known screenwriter, has written extensively about it, having won many awards for things like Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid. So, book you read, chatty, and then why would you keep it? So I've decided, in my case, no, I don't need to. This is fairly wide, so to speak, but not, not too wide. Sybil and Cyril, Cutting Through Time, Jenny Uglo, story Sybil Andrews and Sybil and Cyril Power. I love the art they do. They carved into lino cut and printed. Jenny Uglo, Uglo, not quite sure how you pronounce it, is fabulously gifted in writing about them. She's such a great art historian. There's such quality research. Very engaging. I find this book useful to refer to for university a university essay. But at the end of the day, I discovered the limits of their art and I went, OK, read it, love it, enough. Then we come to the kind of disappointments. <laughs> there's things, there's a pile of books which are slightly disappointing. So this one, Dodo E.F. Benson. Loved her last year. One of my best enjoyable books was, it's not, not her, sorry, his writings on women, his writings on Martha Lucia, hysterical. Read this and the main heroine, Dodo, is a very, very beautiful woman who marries for money and the story is written from the point of view of a guy who really loves her for herself. <clears throat> and I didn't like the main, car main heroine, it just looked like a disaster going to happen. The next one I blame on Steve Donoghue, the booktube. Uh, Letters between Deborah Devonshire and Patrick Lee Furmore in Tearing Haste. He recommended them as really interesting correspondence, but I became very quickly convinced that the Patrick books, the male side of the correspondence, was far more interesting than the other. And Deborah Devonshire had a life of utter privilege in the book She's on a Horse, which was given to her by the Aga Khan and it was a former winner, there it is, former Grand National winner, but she's given us a wee kind of horse to ride about the estate. I couldn't relate to the uh, the, the lifestyle. <clears throat> Patrick, the former, is very funny as a writer, but it's just, I couldn't really get into it. So, these are books that are recommended by other people or gifted. Um, so, one would be that Deborah Devonshire book. Two, Adam Bede, a friend I really like and respect. George Eliot. And of course I'm not casting any aspersions on George Eliot as a novelist, otherwise I would be totally drummed out of the booktube community. But recommended by a friend as the book to get me into her. And it's a kind of remedial cure for having to read Middlemarch at school. I find the characters very, very rural, which totally appealed to my friend and just didn't do it for me. Famous, The Idiot Dostoevsky. Got it as a book because I felt I should read it. And again, it's quite broad. And as I've been a booktube, I've noticed that the classical books always appear. And I find them very readily available in second-hand bookshops. If you go to second-hand bookshops, they're never out of print. You will always get a cheap copy for a few quid when you have the time to read it. This has been sitting in my bookshelf on read for about five years. So it's unlikely I'll get round to it immediately. So it's moving on. Christmas Gift, funny book and it is good for film students. Ayoade on top, Richard Ayoade, and he's taking the satirical look at films that are very, very serious at the whole idea of film theory. It's very funny, it's hilarious, and it would be brilliant for a film student near you. But not for me, it's a sustained book to read. This was recommended, Beth Moore, Praying God's Word, didn't really do it for me. So it's going to go on. You may think I've made a really horrendous mistake or decision by not keeping books like Dostoevsky and George Eliot. Well, worse is to come because I have decided to pass on keeping some books 
either I love but I don't think I'm going to read again or else I really disliked. Here is the shocker. Here is the one that many people think is one of the greatest novels of the 20th century. I have read it once and disliked it. I read it again because everybody else on YouTube seemed to think it was fantastic and I still disliked it. The Great Gatsby, Scott Fitzgerald. I'm just pausing to let people go <gasps> a collective in breath. Love the picture in this one, by the way. It's absolutely beautifully designed by Penguin. But the characters in it I find deeply unlike, unlikable, unrelatable, and I don't enjoy spending time with them. End of story. Collect Dorothy Parker. Now this is also controversial. I put up on Instagram that I was getting rid of some books and immediately Hannah of Hannah's books spotted that I had Dorothy Parker and raised an eyebrow. I had to say I'm getting rid of the book but I'm not getting rid of Dorothy Parker. I've read her, I love her wit, I love her sparkling way of looking at things, her play with words. That's all my mind. So Dorothy Parker is in my heart, she's in my mind in the humour section. So I'm only passing on the book so someone else can enjoy it because I've had it for about 20 years. Now a book I actually recommended in Booktube and I would still stand by that. Um, Whose Body? Dorothy L. Sayers, The First Lord Peter Whimsey Mystery. I genuinely enjoyed reading this last year but I wouldn't read it again because it's a mystery. So for me if I know who did it, who the body was in this case was the big mystery. If I know all of that I don't particularly feel I want to reread it and Lord Peter Wimsey should always be at the local library as will this book which is wonderful. Um, Muriel Spark, A Far Cry from Kensington. There's very few no, fiction books I tend to go back to so this is beautifully written. I totally hand on heart recommend it and would say this was my first Muriel Spark and I need to get to reading some more of her work. It works on so many different levels. I love it, but I remember the story really, really well, so I won't be getting back to it for another while. So many other books to read. And finally, no, there's another pad over there. I've just spotted, sorry. Third Chunkster. And this is hard to let go. Pablo Neruda, all the odes in Spanish and in English. So it's Spanish on one side, one page, side of the page, and English on the other. And I do love it. I really do love it, but I don't read it. Do you understand that? So I've dipped and dived into it. I love the principle, and I'm taking that away, of writing a poem by ordinary everyday things. So let me just read. So, oh, to the apple, barbed wire, to the bed, to bees, to lemon, to laziness, oh, to the liver, oh, to the lizard, oh, to love, oh, to maze. Sperm Whale, Train in China, Trains of the South, Ode to Typography. So they are wonderful. And I take away from that this huge, heavy book, that whole idea of writing a poem about the ordinary, taking an ordinary object, looking at it and writing a poem about it. I really do like that. But the book itself is going to give me about three inches more space on the bookshelf for other books. Whew time to refresh yourselves. All right, ready for the next stack of books. These are books that are good but not good enough. Scorn, Matthew Paris. I recommended this on YouTube and I would say that it, I got some good things from it. It's a collection of the wittiest and wickedest insults in human history. But when you actually get them in a book and you read them through, you start to get weary of all the negativity. And in actual fact, in the introduction, Matthew Paris said they find that too, working on the book. So I've got some good quotes from it, and I will be using those, but I don't necessarily want to keep the book. The Year of Reading Dangerously. This is an account by Andy Miller about getting to reading all the books that he felt he should be reading. It's well written, it's interesting, you read it once and you say okay that's fair enough 
What is more interesting is that he takes part in a book podcast called Backlisted, looking at lots of books that have been out for a while and debating them. That's well worth reading. So this one to read, especially if you're looking for a list of books, like a canon, a collection of books that you think would be good to read, and having the insights, comments and witty remarks of somebody who's also doing the same thing. So worth getting, reading once. Next, Brilliant Careers, the Virago Book of 20th Century Fiction. So you have got extracts from women who've been writing, especially the 20th century, but even earlier than that. And it's a great insight. And it's got an opening quote from Blondie. Here comes the 21st century. It's going to be much better for a girl like me. And it's the book is dedicated to all the 20th century girls. So, very good, but you can keep it forever and you're still not reading the books and the writers themselves. And so, I move on. Next one is by someone, Mary Schmick. She's a journalist. She's most famous for writing the book. She actually wrote an article called Sunscreen which became a best-selling song. And she's actually a, a, a newspaper columnist in Chicago. And she's been a Pulitzer Prize winner. And she writes well. It's called Even the Terrible Things Seem Beautiful to Me Now, which is something her mother said after a lifetime of difficulty with her husband and taking care of uh, a daughter who needed to constant care and really what I find is the book is beautifully written it's a collection of her articles but they are almost all really sad stories and looking back in her family and memoir so if you're thinking well, this is good I just opened it at random Sunday April 27th 1997 the curse of options Give me limits, please. Give me boundaries, no entry signs, expiration dates. Tell me the offer is good only while supplies last. Do not, do not, do not tell me I can have a baby at the age of 63. Wait, I don't mean that. Wait, yes, I do. Possibility is confusing, isn't it? So she's very smart. And if you're thinking about writing a memoir yourself, have a look at her, the way she writes, the style. And if you love terrible stories of people having horrible things, sort of a pain memoir. This would be one to read because she's often, as a journalist, going to the scene of horrible crimes or people that have been suddenly put into terrible situations. So if you like that, this is for you. It doesn't suit me. Next book, Desiring God, John Piper, a Christian classic. I come from the evangelical tradition it's my, in my family and I've read this book find it to be good. I'm ready to move on. I'm increasingly finding some of the evangelical writing a bit narrow. Airhead, The Imperfect Art of Making News by Emily Maitlis. I find her deeply annoying, very privileged and means well, but I didn't really enjoy much other than learning about what happens behind the scenes and making the news. But yeah, so not for me. Next one is great to have if you have space. The novel Cure, an A to Z of literary remedies, which is telling you if you feel this situation in your life, then here's the book you can read. And it covers all different topics. Common Sense, Lack Off, I opened up, um, which is great. And I would recommend Cool Comfort Farm, Stella Gibbons, which is a beloved book, which I'm keeping. Love, Looking for Love, Unrequited Love, Insomnia, Insanity. Hope, loss of hope, being in hospital, flying, fear of flying, flu. In flu, apparently they reckon you should read The Murder of Roger Ackroyd by Agatha Christie. If you like lists, lists of books, this would be a great thing to have on your shelves when you've got space. But if you don't have space, it's just lying there, taking up a couple of inches. So, Dallas Willard, The Divine Conspiracy. Very good book, very well written by a professor, very well thought out. I've read it. 
I've absorbed. Move on. Something a little bit facetious, the Clyde Spotter's Guide, which literally is you look at the Clyde and it tells you what it looks like and it describes it, what's going on physically. So you can look at the sky and it's something I've kind of thought, yeah, I'll really get into that. And I haven't. I really haven't. Name that Clyde. What is this? Can you name that Clyde? Here it says, it's cirrus and it has the appearance of a Clyde in danger of a nervous breakdown. With such chaotic orientations, what variety of cirrus is it? Radiatus, intortus, vertebratus or duplicatus? Duplicatus? Hmm, interesting. So, interesting. Finally, Living on Purpose, again from the Evangelical Tradition, Tom and Christine Sign, moving on, going to somebody else. And that is my roundup of books. Uh, much to my surprise, they are going to be leaving these doors and the space is already spoken for. They've cleared a space, one whole bookshelf wide of space, which is still not enough, but it's an improvement. And I'm now going to go and rearrange things and move things around a bit, try and see what else I can squeeze in. But I do want to say that clearing your shelves can be fairly pleasant, can be letting go. And I think the helpful question is to ask, what is this book doing on my shelf? What is this going to help me with? And sometimes our favourite books are ones that are part of us and we don't actually need to keep the book. But mostly I think a lot of books now are really easy to get. If they're a classic book, if you let it go, you'll still be able to get it somewhere else in a second-hand bookshop. Feeling that you can pay full price, but they will be still in print. The books I keep are the ones that are unusual, maybe slightly academic, narrow interest, very focused, and I know they're going to go out of print and they will not be reprinted. So they're with me. They're the books I live down constantly. If I'm looking at the books and I haven't read it in the last few years, I have to ask, will I again? So I do recommend it. I find it a cleansing experience, almost could say, but I'm surprised at how easy they are to let go and how excited I am for what is going to take their place and how it's going to make me able to use the books I currently have and access, access them and use them for resource and, and reading much easier and also be able just to move them. Space means you can move them around and have them in logical sections. So it's quick to find something, what sections are going to be in. And there's also space for new books. Bye for now.